Please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 7 as we begin tonight. We continue to look at the nature of our warfare with the enemy, our arch enemy, Satan himself. And last time we considered the first of two resources that he uses against us, and it was the world. And tonight we consider the second, which is our own flesh. This morning we had much of what we were to learn couched in Galatians 3, and so we read Galatians 3, 1 to 24. Uh, tonight, what much of what we're going to look at is right in Romans 7. So I want to read, beginning in verse 7, <clears throat> on to the end of the chapter. So Romans chapter 7, let's give our attention. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin, producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no, no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Amen. Thus says the Lord. Well, the second enemy then that Satan uses in his battle against us as believers is our flesh. Our flesh is that inborn traitor in our hearts, which opens a gate into our souls into which Satan and the world may easily send whole troops of temptations to surprise and assail us. What do we mean by the flesh? Well, it's clear from Romans 7 and what we were even talking about in Sunday school this morning, by the flesh we mean that corruption of nature which has defiled both body and soul and has spread and mixed with every part of both. We are sinners. We sin because we're sinners. We're conceived and born in sin. We are guilty, fallen in the covenant of works. We are children of Adam and by nature sinful, totally depraved. Sin lives in us. And as we said this morning, it's so much a part of our nature. It is who we are by nature so that we cannot be separated from it. And because of the flesh, we're all prone to sin. No matter how holy we are, no matter how far we have come in the Christian life, because of the nature of our flesh, because we dwell with our own flesh, we are all prone to sin. None of us is above any sin or beyond any temptation. And we are ready in our flesh to entertain every single temptation that promises to satisfy any of our lusts, whatever it may be. So this secret traitor then conspires with Satan and the world. These three together are our three-headed enemy. 
And so our flesh conspires with Satan and conspires with the world to work our destruction. It entertains and it furthers all their temptations. The flesh is ready. It is as fuel ready to be lit. It is as a match ready to be struck. It is as wood ready to be inflamed. It is at the ready, at the first hint, whiff of any temptation. It is in full support. We need to understand this. Because what this means, as we said this morning, is that our sin nature, our flesh, as Paul calls it here, that law of sin that dwells in my members, it can never be tamed. You can't tame the flesh. You can't tame sin. You can't keep sin like a pet on a leash or in a cage and let it out when you want it. It doesn't work that way. It may let you think that that's what you're doing, that you're in charge. But you are the one in chains. You are the one in the cage. You are the one enslaved. You are the pet, if you will, that sin is using and abusing. But it would lead us to believe, Satan would lead us to believe, that we can do whatever we want, and that if we wanted to stop doing something that we learn is wrong, well, we can stop at any moment. We're doing it because we want to do it. There's truth in that, but we're also doing it because we're an absolute slave to sin. We are, as a horse rushing into battle, we are rushing after the lust and the passions, Peter says, you remember, the passions that wage war against our soul. And that's the nature of the flesh. Peter hit it head on. Right? Our passions wage war against our soul. There is no truce possible. There's no peace possible. There's no reformation possible. That is a reformation of our flesh, a transformation of our flesh. You will never tame your old man. You will never tame your flesh. You will never get control and dominion over any sin. There's only one recourse of action for our flesh, and it is to mortify it. It's to put it to death. Colossians 3, 5, Paul says, put to death Therefore, that which is earthly in you. It's the only option. Remember John Owen's famous statement, be killing sin or it will be killing you. That is its full and only and sole intent is to kill you, destroy you, ruin you. So unless you are set against it with such a passion as to utterly ruin it, destroy and mortify it, it will always get the better of you. Because if we're ever thinking of our own sin and our own flesh and our own, our own inclinations, that we will just moderate them, that we will control them, that we will, we will decrease them, harness them, we're fools. Because the flesh is out to kill you. It's out to destroy you and ruin you. So we have to have the same intent. And in fact, the spirit has the same intent. All right, Galatians 5.17 says the flesh lusts or strives against the spirit. And the spirit strives against the flesh. The spirit has one intent when it comes to the old man. To strive against it. To destroy, to mortify, to ruin the flesh. And that, in fact, is just the flesh's intent against the spirit. And these two wage war within us. And they're at war. So we need to decide, if we can put it this way, we need to decide whose side we're on. As Christians, we need to decide whose side we're on and where we're fighting. Whether we're going to stand with the Spirit, we're going to stand with God, we're going to stand on the side of righteousness, or whether we're going to succumb to the flesh and be taken back, be taken captive to the law of sin, or by the law of sin uh, that dwells in our members. And so the flesh causes us all to be prone to sin. We're ready for temptation. It's a secret traitor that works our destruction. It fights and lusts against the desires and motions of the Spirit. Everything the Spirit of God would intend to do in you, the flesh will oppose it. Paul says it here, whenever I would do good. And Paul is speaking, it's clear that he's speaking of his desires being in alignment with the Spirit's desires. Paul is clear, I long for what the Spirit longs for. In my inner man, I delight after the Lord. I delight after the law. So Paul is completely in step with the Spirit. And the flesh will oppose that at every turn. The flesh rebels against the law of our minds, verse 25, which of course is Paul's word there for our renewed <coughs> image. The flesh leads us captive to the law of sin, Romans 7, 23. 
It hinders us from doing good, verse 18. It makes us commit the evil we hate, Romans 7, 15. The flesh is bent on it. And we've all seen this in our own experience. Even if it's not something that is our particular thing, if you will, the flesh wants to do it just because it's forbidden, just because it's taboo. You know that motion. You know that tug and pull in your heart. It's not something you ever thought of, but the opportunity is there, and it's not supposed to be done. And so the flesh sort of, sort of pokes its head up for a moment. There's something that ought not to be done that could be done. And the flesh hankers for it just because it's taboo, just because, as Romans 7 points out, just because the law says no, the flesh is ready to say yes. And it tugs and it pulls, it tempts, it sways, and it will use the world around us, and it will be in cohort and conspire with the world around us and with all of Satan's suggestions. When Satan drops a suggestion into our minds, the flesh is ready to entertain it and to fan it into flame. When the world presents a temptation of any sort, from whatever's on the television to a billboard to a conversation to the locker room to anything, whatever the world provides to us, the flesh is ready. It doesn't need encouragement. It doesn't need to be awakened. Hey, pay attention. Here's an opportunity. The flesh is always paying attention, always looking for opportunity because it's bent on ruin the ruin and destruction of you. Scripture calls this enemy by many names. And you may think of the passages in which these names are found as I read them, but it's called the old man, the old Adam, the earthly, carnal, and natural man, the sin which is inherent and indwells us, the adjoining evil, John Downham's name, the adjoining evil, which is really, I think, what Paul has here in verse 21, that evil that lies close at hand. It is adjoined with you. You can't shake it off. So it is that adjoining evil or the evil that lies close at hand. It is the law in our members. That's where it lives, dwells, has its habitation. And as Peter says, it is the lust of the flesh or the passions of the flesh which wage war against our soul. That's the person that lives in you, that lives in a soul. In fact, it's you. It's me. It's us. Right? We found the enemy, and it's us. Right? All these names signify the corruption of the nature which we received from Adam. And because of this nature that we have received, because this is the, man, the, the matter in which we are born as covenant breakers in Adam, we're opposed to all good. We're prone to all evil. Think of Paul's, many other, Paul's other letters and where he speaks of this in so many other places, like in the Ephesians chapter 2. We're prone to all evil. We're unable to entertain any good suggestions of the Spirit of God. As we said this morning in Sunday school, unless the Spirit invades and intrudes into our very hearts to give us that new heart and to remove the heart of stone and give a heart of flesh, unless we are at that moment regenerated by the power of the Spirit of God, the best of sermons is ignored. The greatest of preachers is ignored. Just think of how often Christ was ignored. Truly the greatest of preachers. And ignored, not listened to, not heeded, laughed at, mocked, ridiculed, accused, crucified. We're unable to entertain any good suggestions of the Spirit of God. And we are as ready to receive and embrace all the suggestions and all the temptations of the world and the devil as the fuel is ready to receive the fire. Isn't that remarkable? We are dead and asleep to good motions of the Spirit. We are dead and asleep to great preaching and the call of the gospel for rescue, for salvation, for inheritance, for heaven. We are dead and asleep and deaf and blind to the best of calls. But the minute a temptation whispers within hearing, all of a sudden our ears are wide open. All of a sudden, we're awake, alert, attentive, responsive. Where did that come from? Who said that? And we're running after it in a moment. It's because it accords the work of the world and the work of Satan, the work of Satan as using the world as an instrument, it accords with what's in you. These things would not be tempting if there wasn't an appropriate answer in each of us. 
despite the cartoons. It's like dropping a boot on the fish line down to the fish. What fish is going to go after a boot? It's not appetizing. It's not appealing. There's nothing there that the fish wants. There's no response in the fish to that bait. In fact, it's not bait. It's useless. But Satan knows exactly what is bait. He knows exactly what works. He's been doing this for thousands of years, and we're all the same. But more particularly, Satan is not omniscient. We've said this before. Satan can't read your heart. He can't read your thoughts. He can't discern the secret motions and intentions of your heart. But he's such a good observer and journalist, if you will, he doesn't need to. He has watched everything you've let in through eye gate and ear gate. He's heard every word you've said. It's all on record. He doesn't forget these things. He has observed every double take, every book you've read, every magazine you've consulted, every friend you've ever had, every conversation you've ever had, every association in the street, in the alley. He has seen it all. And he keeps records. He knows exactly what's inside of you. He watched you let it in, take it in, absorb it, listen to it, watch it, hear it. He knows what's in your heart. That's why he is so good. That's why it can become so tricky. Think, how does Satan know what I'm thinking? Because he's watched you look that direction before. And he's watched what you've done after you looked in that direction and what it led to. So he knows exactly how to beckon. And this is why baits and temptations work so well. In the, in the devil's hands and coming from the world. This is why they work so well, because he knows the flesh that's in you. It's the same as all of us. But he also knows what you've done with that flesh and what you've led in, what you've cultivated, what you've allowed. And so Satan can bring images to your mind that you haven't thought of in decades. He can bring sins to your mind that you have long repented of, praise God, and you have not thought of that evening for a long, 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 long time. And all of a sudden, right now, in the middle of church, you're thinking of it. And you can see it. And it's so piercing and so vivid. And it grips you. How often is that the devil? Stirring up and provoking. Knowing exactly what's inside your heart. So he can't read it. But he's watched everything go into it. So he knows what's there. And he takes advantage of that. And that's how we are tempted. Turn to James 1. This is how Satan plays his game. This is how he exercises himself, in fact, in what is not a game, but his warfare. James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. How then does it come about? Verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. A temptation would not be a temptation if you didn't have the desire in your flesh for that thing that's being offered to you. Then, desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin, and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. It's only an inevitable wage. John Downham says, As Satan is the father, so the flesh is the mother of sin, which receives Satan's temptations, as it were, into a fruitful womb, using the image here in James 1, conceives, nourishes, and brings forth sin, which is no sooner born, but like a deadly serpent, brings forth death to the body and soul, unless... The poison is overcome and taken away by the precious blood of Christ. That is what spares us from the death we deserve. Forgiveness. Pardon. And how many times has God, by his grace, for his own glorious purposes, intervened in this course? Sin conceived, bringing forth. Desire conceiving, bringing forth. Sin, sin fully grown, bringing forth death. How many times in all of our walks... As God graciously intervened. So we did not receive the fruit of our wages. Or even better, when God cut us off. Before the sin that was conceived in our hearts. Matthew 5. Before that sin was conceived in our lives. And brought forth in our lives. Praise God for his mercy. 
his intervention. Why would God do that? Not because we deserve to be spared, not because the sin we desire and have already hatched in our hearts should not be brought forth in our lives and ruin us all, but simply because God is gracious and he has a better purpose for us. And he will use it to convict us, to humble us, but he will graciously intervene and hinder that course, that inevitable course. So this is the flesh. Two things about the flesh, and then we'll close out tonight with how do we weaken and overcome it. First of all, we see the flesh The flesh is treacherous, and then secondly, that it's dangerous. The flesh is treacherous. Why? Because while it comes off as a dear friend saying to us, spare yourself, don't be so hard on yourself, relax, right? All the ways in which the flesh speaks to us, you deserve this, you've worked hard for this, just once will be okay, you can control this, you won't go overboard, you won't get addicted, you won't go too far. All the things that the flesh tells us to get us just to take the first step. And it comes off as if it is our servant, yet it's in league with Satan and it helps Satan in our overthrow. Turn to Psalm 41, 9. And this is how the flesh works. Psalm of David, foreshadowing our Lord's own suffering at the hands of his close friend. Here in verse 9, David writes, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. And we know the context for that. So here we see, this is how the flesh works. Our flesh pretends to be our close friend. It will eat bread with us. It will sup with us. It will support and encourage us, protect us, look out for us. All with an agenda. Like we learned in Romans 7, the flesh always has an agenda. Your ruin and your destruction, your eternal ruin and destruction, your death. And for us as believers, who by God's grace can never be eternally lost, he will do the flesh's intention is to keep you from growing in grace, from fellowshipping with God, from enjoying the benefits and the comforts of being a believer. Remember Thomas Brooks, if Satan can't keep you out of heaven, then he'll do everything he can to keep heaven out of you. And that's what the flesh is bent on. The first intent of the flesh is to keep you from ever he listening to that preacher, ever going to that church, ever repenting. Once by God's grace, that is prevented, and we are brought to salvation, and the flesh is prevented, then the flesh is bent on your utter uh, ruin by way of breaking your fellowship and your communion with God so that you don't enjoy, so that you are miserable as a Christian. The flesh then is a Judas which daily follows us and eats and drinks and sleeps with us only to betray us into the hands of the enemy who seeks our life. And it does this when it seems lovingly and kindly to kiss us. Remember what Jesus said to Judas, do you befriend, do you, be, do you betray me with a kiss? That's what the flesh does. It betrays us with a kiss. So it's treacherous and no doubt, of course it's treacherous, right? From whence did it come? Our league with the devil himself. And we've already looked at, at the devil's malice, right? The devil is malicious. He's powerful, intent on our ruin, but he's, and he's malicious and has the power to do it. And so the flesh is the same way. The flesh's only hindrance is the spirit. The flesh's only enemy, the only one who can stand up against our flesh is the spirit of God, which is what John says in 1 John 5, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There is victory. There is a place to overcome. There is power to, to overcome. In fact, it takes us back to Ephesians 6. Being strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, we can be victorious. But that's the only way to be victorious. Which is where, of course, this lesson will leave us. So the flesh is treacherous, and then, of course, it's dangerous. And what's so dangerous about it is it's ourselves. That's what's so dangerous taking some of John Downham's language here that's so helpful. The flesh is very dangerous and hard to overcome because it's our own self, and it's the greatest part of our self. We can't forsake it unless we forsake ourselves. We can't fight against it, Downham says, unless we raise intestine and civil war in our own bowels. Where is the flesh 
Paul says, in me, at my elbow, close at hand, me. We can't vanquish it unless we subdue ourselves. And if we seek to run away from it, we might as easily flee our own shadows because we carry it in our own bosoms. See how hard then this enemy is to overcome. It can be overcome by God's grace. John says, by faith we overcome the world, and certainly we can then overcome our flesh. But how hard is it to overcome? And see how dangerous and irksome this fight is which, in which ourselves must be enemy to ourselves, Downham says, so that we can't obtain the victory unless we're overcome. We can't be sure of life unless we mortify and kill our greatest part. And we can't sustain ourselves without nourishing our enemy. And we can't famish our enemy without starving ourselves. Do you feel and see now why Paul speaks as he does with his language? And why Christ even says, let a man deny himself? Why does scripture speak of dying to yourself? Why Paul uses the language of mortify that which is earthly in you? And why Jesus says, Cut off the hand, pluck out the eye, cut off the foot, cast it from you. Where is this flesh? It's me. It's you. It's a part of us. It's in us. This is our case. If we were to describe it or think of it this way, we're besieged with foreign forces, the world and the devil. And we nourish within our own walls secret traitors, which is our own flesh with all of its lusts and passions. So we are besieged with two great enemies. And dwelling in within our own fortress is a traitor in league with those enemies. And so our flesh is continually ready to open the gates of our souls through all our senses, eye gate and ear gate, and let in whole troops of temptations until we're overwhelmed. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Sin in me. And you will remember Parley the Porter by Hannah Moore. And if that's news for you, you've got to look it up and read it. You can find a PDF online. Highly, highly recommend Parley the Porter. Parley lives in the heart of every man. And he's the porter. He guards the door. He lets things come and go. And he is deceived by the enemy without who appears to be a great friend. And he lets the enemy in. And that's how the flesh works. That's the sinfulness of our own hearts. This is why the Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Because within the heart dwells Parley the porter. That's where he lives. He's a part of our own selves. We can't out Parley. He lives and dwells as a part of our own selves. And he's a traitor. There's only one course of action for Parley. We have to die. Only then does Parley the Porter die. That's Paul's conclusion. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, this victory. But as Owen finally said, you remember, the only, the only hope and help for this body of death is the death of this body. When we die, Parley dies because the flesh dies, but not before. Much more could be said about this enemy, but I want to come straight to application tonight. How do we weaken the flesh? A few directions here. First of all, we must be resolved by the grace of God in Christ to stand our ground fully guarded and armed in Christ with his strength and armor. This is why, turn to Ephesians 6. This is why it is so helpful to renew in your own heart and mind To renew your membership vows. Every single time you see another person become a member and make a profession of faith with those five membership vows, you need to renew your own. You need to resolve again by the grace of God. Yes, Lord, I too, here again in your presence, make that promise. Whenever you witness a baptism... Yes, Lord, I too, here again in your presence, resign myself unto you. Wash me. I am yours. And I have taken on the name of God. The name of God, in fact, has been put upon us in our baptism. 
and we are aligned with the Lord and we serve him. Renew your membership vows. Renew your baptismal vows. Think often of them because this is what's needed. These, this resolution, this, this resolve in our very souls that by the grace of God in Christ, we will be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So 6.10 of Galatians. Finally, says Paul, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be, be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. What a, what a daunting enemy. Who is a match for such a force of evil that stands against us? Well, we're not a match. But Paul says if we are strong in the Lord and the power of his might, Paul says if we put on the whole armor of God, we are a match. In that sense. Therefore, he says in verse 13, take up the whole armor of God, despite all that enemy, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. But this has to be your resolve, beloved. You have to be absolutely convinced. And this is why this, these, and, and I say renew your membership vows because those resolutions and those promises that adherence and that surrender to the Lord Jesus and our membership vows is not something we do at conversion only and not something we do at church membership only. It is a daily covenanting, a daily renewal. And what a better thing uh, is the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is for covenant renewal, right? That's why we have the institution before we take the supper and the, the reminder that here all our sins are to be laid here is a surrender once again unto the Lord and a confidence in His work and a resolution to be His. Every Lord's Supper Sunday is a perfect opportunity for your own covenant renewal. Don't forget that. That's how our resolution is strengthened. Because if we don't make some sort of revisit to our resolution in our own hearts and minds, how easily will you even forget what you promised? We won't even think of our baptismal vows. We won't even think of our membership vows. And when someone else becomes a member, we'll just be thankful and say, that's wonderful, look at that, a new member, without even ever stopping to consider. I said those words, I made those promises, I did them, and I need to do it again. Now lay that to your conscience, because that's the way to strengthen yourself. James 4, 7 and 8, look at what he says. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. There's that resolution. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and, be, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Renew your resolve. Renew your resolution, your commitment, your surrender to God. It's the only way to weaken the flesh. Otherwise, we will become subject to it. We will become deceived by it. Turn to 1 Corinthians 10. First Corinthians 10, 13, and 14. I'll begin in verse 12, actually. Paul says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. The resolve to run as Joseph did from Potiphar's wife, to flee from idolatry, to flee sexual immorality, to flee sin, to leave your cloak and run. That's not just going to happen when temptation comes. You're not going to be just, okay, have the strength you need unless it, you have cultivated it, renewed your covenant, strengthened your resolution, and stayed close to God. If you don't do that, then when temptation comes, you're a sitting duck. Because you've already been weakened by the fact that you've not ever, that you've failed and neglected to think about your surrender again to God and your resolutions to follow the Lord and to die to self, take up your cross and follow him. So be resolved by the grace of God to stand your ground with the Lord's armor. Secondly, of course, then turn to 2 Corinthians 10. Secondly, we need to take every thought captive. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 
We need to condemn every thought, desire, and stronghold that stands opposed to righteousness. Whatever it is, do like Joseph. Condemn it. Call it the sin that it is. Call it the wickedness that it is. And run. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 6. Paul says, Though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. And it's a good thing those weapons have that power because that's the nature of the enemy. God has equipped us with weapons suitable, proportional, and appropriate to the enemy we fight, which Paul talked about in Ephesians 6, what that enemy is. We destroy strongholds and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete ready to punish every disobedience of your own, ready to punish every temptation to disobedience in your heart, every seduction of the world, every suggestion of Satan. Punish it. Call it what it is. Take it captive that we might obey Christ. And here's what I think is helpful. We read in Romans 7 that sin takes occasion by the law. That when the law says, thou shalt not, sin says, yes, I will. That's what our flesh says. But here's the thing. Sin is said to take occasion by the law to rear its ugly head. Well, we also need to be on the alert, as sin is. We need to be on the, on the alert and take occasion by sin. When sin rears its ugly head, we need to see that as an occasion to t- raise up all our weapons of warfare against it. In other words, why not fight back? That's what Ephesians 6 is saying. Right? Why wouldn't you fight back? Sin has reared its ugly head. A temptation has been dropped before you. Sin says, I want that. Let's go get it. That's an occasion for you to put on the armor of God. It's the occasion for you to exercise the weapons of your warfare. It's the occasion for you to take that thought captive. It's the occasion to run. It's the occasion to call a friend. Whatever it is, it's an occasion to respond in a godly manner with an eye to overcoming and mortifying that sin that has just reared its ugly head. Because what has it done? It has revealed itself. You know, sin, how how the enemy lurks in the shadows, and you don't know where it is or from which direction it comes. But the minute you hear it, the minute you see the white of its eyes, guess what? It has given itself away, hasn't it? And when sin rears its head in our own hearts and it seeks to lunge after a temptation that has been presented or entertain a thought that has been dropped into our minds, what has it done? But it has revealed its presence. It's revealed its location. It's revealed its intent. It has lost and given up its cover. We then have an opportunity to fight back. We have an opportunity, Ephesians 6, to stand our ground. To wield the sword of the Spirit. To be protected with the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. The occasion is there. It's no wonder whether these weapons are even useful to be, or excuse me, this armor is even useful that we carry around all the time. When are we ever going to see any war? When are we ever going to see the, see the battle? Satan has just told you, And your flesh has just told you, sin has just alerted you that it's ready to fight. And either you're going to give in and surrender and follow after the temptation and let your flesh embrace and lead you captive to sin, or you're going to take occasion by the sin as it takes occasion by the law and say, no, by the grace of God, I hereby resolve, no, I'm done with that. And run and flee and mortify. That's the only way you're going to overcome sin. And that's the only way you're actually going to get the victory. And it's the only way you're going to actually weaken your flesh. Because if sin reveals itself, rears its ugly head and lets you know its intent. And you don't fight back with the appropriate measures and means of grace. Every time you give in to sin, you are being weakened. You're weakening the spirit. You're weakening your new man. You're giving up ground. And you're fueling and feeding your own flesh. No wonder if next time it's easier. And the next time, easier still. And the next time, easier still. And then the next time, you don't even wait for the suggestion or the opportunity. 
You create the opportunity. Because we're so taken up by it and blinded and seared and numbed. We all know that by experience and how that works. So we need to resolve to stand our ground against the flesh. Secondly, we need to take every thought of the flesh captive in order that we might obey Christ. Thirdly, then, we need to lay hands on our lusts, our sinful desires. We need to bring them to the place of judgment, which should be the law, as we heard in Sunday school this morning. By the law comes knowledge of sin. The law calls sin to be sin and shows it to be exceedingly sinful. And so we bring our lusts out, we bring our sinful desires out, we bring it to the law and we show it to be what it is. And we judge it, we call it sin. And we condemn that sin to death. In other, in other words, resolve by the grace of God that it be killed and mortified. And so Galatians 3.10 here Paul says, Cursed is everyone who does not obey or not walk in all the works of the law to do them. All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. In other words, what comes to lawbreakers? The curse. We need to call sin what it is. We need to see it for what it's intending to work, and that is our death and condemnation. Again, we come to Genesis 39, 9. Joseph, how can I do this great wickedness against God? He called the temptation what it was. It was wickedness. We're not told beyond Joseph's words whether there was even a moment's hesitation or whether there was a moment of inclination. In fact, Scripture presents Joseph immediately aware of her, aware of this temptation because of the, the, the pleas and beggings of, the, of Potiphar's wife before that time, Joseph had already strengthened himself. He had already strengthened his resolve. He had already taken every thought captive. Joseph was ready. And the minute the temptation, the opportunity presented itself, Joseph ran. And so Galatians, excuse me, Colossians 3, again, Paul's language, very strong. Colossians 3, verse 5, 5 to 10, listen to what Paul says. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. So putting them to death, putting them all away, same reality. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So we need to lay our hands on our lust, our sinful desires and inclinations, and bring them out to the place of judgment and condemn them to death. We need to do as Michael did uh, to, to Satan in Jude 9, the Lord rebuke you. That's how we need to speak to our own sinful desires. That's as Joseph spake to it. This is wicked. I cannot, will not do this against God. And he renewed that resolve. What if the enemy is too great? What if we find that our lust, our, our sinful desires are too strong? What do we do then? We cannot yet bring them out and mortify them. And we take the next best step. And we starve them. We weaken them. This is what you do to an enemy. Until an enemy is able to be overcome, you besiege it and you starve it. This is what a siege does to a fortress. It lays siege and just waits, letting no resources go in until the people are starved. We see that in the scriptures. And this is what we do. We do all we can to weaken the flesh by depriving it of food, provision, fuel, weapons, armor, ammunition, and all other means by which it is finding strength against us. Turn to Romans 6. This is exactly what Paul is talking about. Romans 6, look at verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Well, how am I not to let sin reign? Its passions are strong. How am I not to let it reign anymore? Do not, verse 13, present your members as sin to, 
uh, to sin as instruments for righteous, unrighteousness. What does that do? It strengthens the flesh. But rather present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. What does that do? Weakens the flesh. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Praise God for the testimony and the promise of verse 14. And that reality is the case because of our being born again and united to Christ. Sin does not have dominion anymore and it will not have dominion. But Paul even said in Romans 7 that if we're not careful, it can carry us captive. And we all know what that feels and looks like. Taken captive by our own sinful hearts and finding ourselves running in the path of that which we hated and do not want to do and yet we're doing it. How did I get here? Somewhere along the way, we let sin get a foothold. And that takes just self-examination to figure out what happened there. But the reality is, we weaken the flesh by depriving it of all of its food and nourishment, and then we proceed, when it's weak, with the former course of justice against it. This is evil. God, deliver me. Lord, give me strength against this. I can't overcome this. I'm struggling with this, Lord. Give me victory over this bosom sin. And so we weaken until it's weak enough that we can find victory by God's grace. And so the kind of questions here that we need to ask ourselves, that you need to ask yourself, and I need to ask myself, what is feeding your lust? What is feeding your bosom sin? Because there's no, we're never going to be able to starve it and weaken it unless we stop to consider what it's eating, what it's fueling on, right? What in your life, what in your habits, what in your company is your sinful desire feeding on? Because if you find it strong, it's finding food. And this is the nature of our bosom sin, isn't it? It's why it's our bosom sin. It's why it's so hard to overcome. Because it finds fuel in our lives that, as Jesus says, needs to be cut off. We'll never overcome a sin. We'll never be able to turn from a temptation unless we deal with those things which lead to it. What is fueling, feeding, cultivating, nourishing our sin, our sinful desires? That's where we have to begin. And so then finally, the fourth step to weaken the flesh, is we must find our strength and power through God's Spirit. That's the whole point of Ephesians 6. This can't be done in your own strength. It's only by the strength of God and His Spirit in us that we will find ourselves able, by grace, through faith in Christ, to mortify, to kill, and to abolish the flesh with its lusts. Scripture tells us to do it. 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, here in Romans 6, Colossians 3, in Ephesians 5, or Ephesians 4 rather, Scripture tells us to do it, which means by grace it can be done. We will never do it perfectly. We will never be blameless. We will never tame the flesh. But we can get victory. We can gain ground. We can be the offense on the offensive and gain yardage. That's what we can do more and more and more and more by the grace of God, as our catechism says. And if we find our spirit weak and we find the flesh strong, then we must pray to God to help us disable the flesh by fasting and prayer. Remember what Jesus says, some things come out only by fasting and prayer. What a wonderful way to weaken the flesh. In that sense, we're not starving it so much as we are fueling the new man. That's what fasting and prayer does. It fuels the new man. And by depriving the flesh of the food which nourishes it, believing that if we ask God, he will help us. Ask and you shall receive. Again, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. From even you, so weak and frail as you are, a nothing, but he will flee even from you, because greater is he that is in you, that is in you than he that is in the world, and by faith we overcome the world. John Downham closes this way. But if instead of mortifying our flesh, we pamper it, we will but strengthen our enemies to cut our own throat. If we delicately bring up this servant, which we should subdue as a slave, at length it, it'll be not only our son, but a tyrannous lord and master. 
which will bind us hand and foot in the fetters of sin and cast us into the prison of hell. What folly, therefore, is it to nourish and arm our enemy to our own destruction? Right? We talked last week about worldliness, the danger of worldliness. And again, worldliness begins in your own heart. How foolish, then, it is to allow the world to cultivate your own prone, proneness to proclivities to worldliness. Well, the same respect here, how foolish it is to pamper the flesh when that's only nourishing your enemy against you. Don't ever believe that the flesh is for you. It is against you as much as the devil is against you, as much as the world is against you. Those who love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Those who make the world, says James, a friend, make God their, in, their enemy. We need to realize the danger of these three. And it begins with realizing the danger of our own hearts. We need to be regenerated and we need to live by faith and use the means of grace. And ultimately, the only right course of action at this point is we need to put on the whole armor of God. It's the only course for a Christian to take. It's the only place for victory. Again, there's no passage in Scripture quite like Ephesians 6 and how helpful it is for the church because it gives us such clear directions and equipage for what lay ahead of us is this warfare that we wage as a believer all our days until the Lord calls us home. So resolve by the grace of God to, to continue to study this and prepare for what it means to put on the whole armor of God. And Lord, Lord willing, we'll begin to look at that next Lord's Day. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we look to you tonight mindful of your amazing power, mindful of your creating power, having brought this world into existence out of nothing by the word of your power in the space of six days and all very good. And yet even greater, O oh God, than the power of creation is the power of recreation, the power by which you have made us new by which you have taken sinners into your family and made them saints, by which you have caused us to be born again and rescued and delivered us from the throes of darkness and sin and death and hell and Satan, that we might be united to and find communion with your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for these many weeks now that we have studied the Christian warfare. We have learned much along the way already, and yet, Lord, we are... Standing, Lord, at, a, at an important and critical point where we have been convinced of the great need to put on the whole armor of God. We pray, O oh Father, that you would bless us as we continue to learn what this means, what this looks like practically in the Christian life. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding. Give us the wherewithal, O oh Lord, to walk in this way and to stand where we ought. And do indeed, O oh Lord, equip us and enable us to serve you well. Please forgive us now of our many sins. Forgive us, O oh God, where we have bowed to our own flesh, where we have given heed to our flesh, where we have listened to our hearts and been led astray. Forgive us, Father, for how prone we are to worldliness and to evil and to sin. Forgive us for not standing our ground as we ought. Forgive us for not renewing our membership vows, our resolutions, our surrender, our baptismal vows. And cause us, O oh God, to see the importance of regularly covenanting with you, renewing what it means to deny ourselves, take up the cross, and follow Christ. Fill us, we pray, with your spirit. Take us into the week ahead now. Equip us and enable us for all that is yet ahead of us, O oh Lord. May we serve you well in our workplaces, in our homes, in our marriages, in our families. May all that we do bring you glory. And may we be a light in a dark world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.